welcome to the next session of our uh, discussion on the fluorescence uh, methods. Uh, we will continue our discussion on the fluorescence measurements. For uh, analytical purposes, determination of absolute fluorescence may not be necessary. Moreover, due to changes in the lamp intensity and monochromator detector systems with age, it is usually necessary to standardize an instrument. The simplest approach to this problem is to measure the fluorescence intensity of a standard reference compound prior to each measurement. A good reference compound should be easily soluble, it should be purifiable and be stable in air and it should be light stable. It should also have a broad fluorescent spectrum. Quinine and quinine sulphate derivatives are eminently suited for this purpose. Anthracene, fluorescein and pyrene dyes have also been used as uh, reference compounds. Emission and excitation spectra are usually measured and presented as signal versus wavelength plots. This system creates considerable confusion if the data are to be compared from instrument to instrument. Therefore, corrected spectra, sometimes they are called as true spectra, are uh, utilized for this purpose. An apparent spectra has to be corrected for scattered light, Raman emission, solvent interactions and sample cell fluorescence. This is easily accomplished by recording the background spectrum of the blank solution and then you can subtract the sample uh, fluorescence from the blank solution. So, quantitative determination you can usually carry out by using calibration curves just like in uh, spectrophotometry which are nothing but plots of fluorescence intensity, fluorescence intensity versus concentration. So, calibration curves are usually linear in the range of 10 raise to minus 4 to 10 raise to minus 6 molar. At greater concentrations obviously, linearity would be affected and you should not be working uh, if the linearity is compromised because of the difficulties in reproducing the fluorescence measurements. Many of the transition elements are uh, basically uh, paramagnetic and hence they are not suitable for fluorescence. You remember that uh, we had discussed that diamagnetic substances are suitable for fluorescence and uh, pa definitely paramagnetic substances do not form fluorescing species by chelate formation also. Moreover, transition metals have closely spaced energy levels which enhances internal conversion. Therefore, Fluorescence methods are applicable mostly to non-transition uh, uh, elements, metal ions, which are mostly colorless. And but they do, they must, they also tend to form colorless chelates. Uh, what are such compounds? Basically, aluminum, beryllium, zircon, boron, zinc, gallium, germanium. Silicon, etcetera. These substances react with fluorometric reagents such as 8 hydroxyquinoline, alizarine, garnet red R, flavanol, benzoin, rhodamine G, 6 G, rhodamine B, rhodamine 6 G, etcetera, crystal violet, and there are several other uh, fluorescing agents uh, which can react with such elements to give. Uh, fluorescing uh, substances which can be measured. In the now, I will show you a, a list of methods, fluorometric methods for some inorganic metal ions. And uh, uh, here you can see the I have listed on the left side elements here. So, here I am showing you the elements like aluminum which can be determined using alizarin garnet R. Its uh, absorption wavelength is 470 
and fluorescence occurs at 500 nanometers and uh, limit of detection is 0 0.007 micrograms per milliliter that is uh, almost uh, 7 ppb parts per billion, but the, you can see there are some interferences like this beryllium, cobalt, chromium, copper, iodine etcetera some of the elements. Another method fluorescing fluorescence technique is for fluoride and uh, here the reaction of quenching of aluminum complex of alizarin garnet R is utilized as a fluorescing uh, analytical method and the absorption is again at 470 and fluorescence occurs at 500. Limit of detection you can see is 0 0.001 mi microgram per milliliter. Now, you can see that these uh, limits are much better than absorption methods. Of course, there will always be some uh, uh, amount of interferences in all the methods. For example, this borate reacts with benzoin to produce fluorescence around 450 nanometers and the limit of detection is approximately 0 0.04. In this case uh, only beryllium and antimony interfere. Similarly, cadmium can be determined using 2 orthohydroxyphenyl benzoxazole and it gives you a fl blue fluorescence, excitation absorption wavelength is 365 and limit of detection is 0 0.2 mi mi mili microgram per milliliter only ammonia interferes in this case. Similarly, there are some of the uh, methods uh, for uh, lithium with 8 hydroxyquinoline and then tin with benzoin, zinc um, with flavanol etcetera. But generally what happens is most of the fluorescence methods are available for uh, about 30 to 35 elements and uh, these uh, elements uh, can be determined they are, they are all available in the database. If you look up uh, the database for spectrophotometry or fluorescence, you would see that most of these elements are listed along with their methods and you can get the analytical conditions for their determination in PPM or PPB levels. The most important application of course, uh, for fluorometry is in the analysis of food products and pharmaceuticals, clinical samples, natural products and physiologically important compounds like our body fluids, plasma etcetera. Dean has listed more than 200 organic and biochemical compounds including diverse species such as adenine, anthranilic acid, aromatic uh, polycyclic hydrocarbons, these are known as PAH polyaromatic hydrocarbons. And they are present in the air and uh, as pollutants, cysteine, guanine, isoniazid, these are all um, some compounds of uh, amino acids, uh, amino acid compounds, naphthols, neurogases such as sarin and tabun, proteins can be determined, salicylic acids, scatol, tryptophan, uric acid, warfarin and several other elements like this adrenaline, porphyrin, penicillin, phenobarbital, many of the drugs. You know, procaine, reserpine, lysergic acid, diethylamide etcetera can be determined using uh, fluorescence methods and uh, these methods are available in the database. One can look up the specialized uh, books which will uh, list such uh, reactions and it must it is important to note that fluorometry and phosphorimetry tend to be approximately com complementary because most of the uh, uh, strongly fluorescing compounds also exhibit weak fluorescence and uh, vice versa. Phosphorescence has been used for analytical determination of nucleic acids, pyrene, pyridine, pyridine penza, enzymes, petroleum hydrocarbons, pesticides, insecticides etcetera. However, the method has not found wi widespread uh, um, acceptance owing to the requirement of low temperature for measurement and poorer precision of the analysis. Therefore, people usually do not go for phosphorescence as an analytical technique, but it can be done however. So, 
considerable advances have been made in the development of room temperature fluorescence phosphorimetry in the last two decades because otherwise you will have for any phosphorimetric measurements have to be done at liquid nitrogen temperature if you remember the discussion we had earlier. In these applications the analyte is bound to a solid support as a filter such as a filter paper or you can use silica gel etcetera. Then what do you do? A solution of the analyte is dispersed in the solid and the solvent is evaporated. So, you get a subst solid substance and the phosphorescence of the method is then determined. So, basically what you are achieving is a rigid matrix that minimizes the activation of the triplet state deactivation of the triplet state by collision quenching that is important. So, you can also um, an incorporate the analyte into a core of missiles. So, you know what is missiles? Missiles are basically uh, surface active agents like our uh, detergents which form uh, hydrophilic which are long molecule substances which have got hydrophilic uh, bonding at one end and hydrophobic tendencies at the other end of the molecule. So, they tend to curl you, a long molecule if you take it would not stand still it will train to curl and you can incorporate the analyte in such missiles uh, which also serves to protect the triplet state. Similarly, donut shaped polymers such as cyclodextrins have been used for the measurement of phosphorimetry. In most of the room temperature experiments heavy atoms such as thallium, lead, silver and halide ions are used to promote intersystem crossing because we know that such systems promote um, phosphorescence. So, fluorescence measure measurements are nowadays again we are switching our discussion back to fluorescence. So, fluorescence measurements are nowadays important tools for the detection and determination of samples eluting from a high pressure liquid chromatographic column. We will study about uh, the chromatography later and these uh, fluorescence uh, uh, equipments are used as detectors in uh, fluores uh, fluorescent detectors and it is also useful as a detector in capillary electrophoresis columns. These applications we will discuss in the chromatographic techniques. Now, you can um, imagine that fluorescence is uh, not only important at PPB levels uh, of the determination of metals and uh, organic and inorganic compounds, biochemical compounds etcetera, but you can also imagine that uh, it can be used for uh, cutting edge uh, technology development. One of them is uh, the to obtain localized images of fluorophores in single cells in the human body. Now, to monitor the cell dynamics for example, fluorescent indicators can be used as ion probes in biological events. One such uh, ion probe changes its excitation or emission spectrum upon binding with calcium or sodium ion and these ions are present in our body. So, these indicators can be used to record events that take place in different parts of the individual neurons or a group of neurons. I have selected this uh, technique uh, to introduce you to the new uh, system of thinking or following biological events in the human body. For example, the Difura 2, it is a, a trade name readily available in the market. It has been used to monitor free intracellular calcium concentration following pharmaceutical or electrical simulation. What do we mean by that? You are suffering from something, we give you a pharmaceutical um, drug and then we want to follow what is happening at the cell level in presence of this drug in the human body. 
So, by following the fluorescence changes as a function of time uh, at the specific site in the neuron, one can determine when and where a calcium dependent electrical event took place. So, such an application finds widespread use in Purkinje reaction neuron in the cerebellum and fluorescence transients are recorded as changes in fluorescence relative to the steady fluorescence delta f by f correlated with the sodium action potential spikes and um, very exciting application um, of fluorescence. Now, I would uh, be failing in my duty if I do not talk to you about chemiluminescence methods. Now, you know that we have discussed luminescence in this um, uh, in the last 3 4 lectures we have discussed that luminescence includes fluorescence, phosphorescence and chemiluminescence as well, but we have not discussed about chemiluminescence so far. So, now I would like to discuss with you chemiluminescence because in the last 2 3 decades chemiluminescence has uh, uh, acquired lot of importance as an analytical tool. The application of chemiluminescence in analytical science is a recent development. Of course, the phenomenon has been known since quite long time. So, what we are trying to um, observe in chemiluminescence is that several compounds in the environment react with a chemical species to give chemiluminescence. The attractive features of chemiluminescence phenomena include its simplicity, very simple reaction you just take 2 reagents let them react and they react to give a product which will generate a, an electromagnetic uh, radiation which can be monitored. And um, because of its simplicity and extreme sensitivity and high coupled with high selectivity have propelled the development of chemiluminescence techniques. And um, basically you can represent uh, chemiluminescence reactions as uh, simple systems like A plus B going to C star plus D. These are reactants A and B react to give you a product C star and D and this C star uh, is excited species and um, it goes to C plus H mu. That means, the conversion of C star to C is accompanied by the emission of radiation and this radiation has to be specific to this reaction A plus B going to C star plus D. Therefore, the total reaction is nothing but A plus B going to C plus H mu. So, the radiation intensity I C L that is nothing but photons emitted per second. It depends upon the rate of production that is d c by d t conversion of uh, c and the quantum yield phi c l that is the number of photons per molecule reacted which in turn is dependent upon the quantum yield phi e x it which is nothing but excited states per molecule reacted and the emission quantum yield phi e m. So, this phi i c l is um, basically related to all these things and uh, we can express the reaction like this i c l is equal to phi c l into d c by d t and phi c l is nothing but the product of excitation and emission followed by d c by d t. So, the analytically useful chemiluminescence have values of phi C L ranging from 0.01 to 0 0.02. That means, in this equation we have to put 0.01 to 0.502 and the reaction can be monitored successfully using these reactions. So, the instrumentation for chemiluminescence measurements basically what it contains? It contains the uh, re a re reactor system 
in which the react, uh, reactants are mixed and then you have a slit to collect the radiation that is coming out and then a monochromator to collect the radiation at a particular wavelength and measure and relate it to concentration. So, the instrumentation for chemical luminescence measurements consists of a suitable reactor followed by a monochromator and a photomultiplier tube very simple reaction. The chemical luminescence signal has to be time dependent because in a given batch reactor there is always certain amount of the um, reactant available and the reaction uh, system as it proceeds it will reach a maximum concentration and then it will decay. So, the um, uh, optimum concentration uh, and the signal corresponding to the optimum concentration has to be measured. So, the chemical emission signal is basically time dependent one which rises rapidly to a maximum as the reactants combine and decays exponentially after that. I will show you a figure subsequently uh, after this. So, for quantitative analysis the signal has to be integrated for a fixed time and compared with a standard treated in the same way. So, either the you can use either peak height or the peak area for this purpose. Now, I here I am showing you a figure of chemical luminescent signal as a function of time. Here you can see the uh, axis is time and the uh, other signal is emission intensity. You can see that the as the reactants continue to mix react producing C star it will reach a maximum here and then it will decrease exponentially as the reaction goes to completion. So, you have to measure the signal at this height you can use either peak height or peak area defined by time that is the you have to integrate the signal with the between two time limits. So, uh, the theory is very simple applications are very simple, but the beauty is they can be used for parts per billion level of analysis. Now, I am giving you an example like this analysis of nitric acid oxide. So, the basic reaction is nothing but nitric oxide is reacting with ozone to produce NO2 excited state plus O2 and NO2 will um, re revert back to nitric oxide unexcited molecule along with the emission of electromagnetic radiation and this lambda is, is somewhere between 600 and 2800 nanometers. You can use any radiation in this range and uh, uh, make sure that you are uh, collecting the radiation of only a particular wavelength. So, linear response in this reaction is a is from 1 ppb parts per billion to 10,000 parts per billion ppm not billion ppm and this reaction is used for the determination of nitric oxide from the ground level up to in stratosphere up to altitudes of about 20 kilometers also that means, not only in the ground level, but also in the at high altitudes and such reactions are important to us to study the variation of nitri uh, nitric oxide as it is exists in the stratosphere. Another reaction I want to show you here that is NO2 nitric oxide decomposes at about 700 degree centigrade to nitrogen and oxygen and this nitrogen and oxygen can also combine to form nitric oxides and uh, nitric oxide again combine with ozone to produce NO2 excited molecule and oxygen and such reactions occur in the vehicles where you have the petrol or diesel burning in presence of air and um, nitrogen oxide, nitrogen dioxide, NOx, nitrogen ox, nitric oxide 
all these things can form and what you can do is to collect part of the uh, emission uh, gases and allow them to react with o ozone to produce NO2. So, this has got applications to automobile exhaust where you can see the concentration of nitrogen oxides which is actually a, a an environmental pollutant. Similarly, phosphorus can be reacted with hydrogen um, flame, a hydrogen burning, burning hyd phosphorus can be introduced in a burning hydrogen flame which produces HPO star um, molecule which is luminescence wise very active and it has got uh, lambda max for 526 nanometers. So, uh, you may ask what is the importance of such uh, reactions? The importance of such reactions is that many of the phosphorus compounds are used in uh, substances like pesticides, insecticides, DDT and several other uh, environmentally damaging compounds and we do not have easy means or simple means of the determination of such compounds at PPB levels. And uh, believe me at PPB levels the damage is done not in PPM or the uh, uh, milligram level even at PPB levels such uh, substances can cause damage to the cells. Uh, and um, one of the very important reaction uh, for the determination of phosphorus in the environment. And um, the next uh, example I have chosen is the determination of ozone. Now, you know about ozone, most of the ozone is there in our on the earth at a height of about uh, 11 to uh, 60 kilometers and um, ozone layer everybody has heard of and ozone is supposed to absorb the ultraviolet radiations coming from the sun and protect us. And all of you must have heard about ozone hole where ozone is being consumed to be a part of the atmospheric reactions at high altitudes and the ozone concentration depletes over a particular area in the space. This is known as ozone hole. Now, how to determine the ozone? Uh, ozone gas and that is itself is in PPB levels and um, the ozone can be determined by reaction with rhodamine B. It is uh, absorbed on silica gel from 1 PPB to 400 parts per billion. And, um, it can also be determined by reacting with ethylene, but that is not such a popular reaction. But uh, ozone reacting with rhodamine B always gives you a beautiful fluorescent spectrum, chemiluminescent spectrum, not even fluorescence. And uh, both these reactions are specific for ozone. Now, another reaction is determination of sulfur dioxide, that is the again. I want to stress here that the uh, determination of sulfur dioxide is a very important part of our uh, environmental cleanup procedures because sulfur dioxide is emitted by um, thermal power stations and several other industries metal, metal smelting etcetera and also by almost all the vehicles that we use they all contain sulfur. So, the reaction with sulfur uh, when the petrol burns the sulfur reacts with oxygen to form sulfur dioxide and the atmospheric sulfur dioxide concentration goes up uh, during whenever the, a vehicle is passing by and uh, the concentration of sulfur dioxide follows a diurnal pattern in a city when lot of people are going for work the concentration increases and then when um, when the people are in their workplaces and vehicle population is less then the concentration decreases and again when the substance when people 
start coming back from the office again the vehicles will be starting petrol will be burning and sulfur dioxide will be being generated and the concentration of sulfur dioxide in the environment goes up. So, the uh, concentration of sulfur dioxide in the atmosphere describes a diurnal pattern that means two maxima if you plot the concentration of sulfur dioxide in the air versus time. So, the determination of sulfur dioxide is also a very important part of environmental management especially because it is coming from the transport vehicles and you all know how important transport is to our modern society. So, the reaction of sulfur dioxide with hydrogen produces an excited sulfur uh, molecule and water of course and this excited sulfur molecule uh, luminesces giving you a radiation at 384 and 394 nanometers. So, this is another reaction that can be used for uh, determination of sulfur dioxide by chemiluminescence method. Now, here I am showing you one more example that is the a compound like this with two N H groups C O and um, it reacts with uh, hydroxide in presence of oxygen to form luminol. This is a thalic anhydride, thalic acid um, anion and um, you know, plus nitrogen etcetera. This uh, luminesces at 425 nanometers. The product is known as luminol. Now, carbon dimonoxide chromium 3 and cobalt 2 plus chromium and copper etcetera such metal ions catalyze this reaction and uh, the concentration for catalysts are very very minimal. So, the you can determine the concentration of a substance by the production of numenol luminol by using very low concentrations and the detection limits obtained for this are 0 0.01 uh, nanomoles per liter for cobalt and uh, 0.5 nanomoles per liter for chromium and 1 nanomole per liter for Cu 2 plus that is copper. So, many such metal ions can catalyze this reaction including hydrogen peroxide and uh, then there are other uh, determinations uh, by chemiluminescence and these include uric acid and oxygen these are all enzymatic reactions I am collecting the some of the examples and uh, uric acid reacts in presence of uricase to produce allantoin and hydrogen peroxide and um, uh, hydrogen, as you know hydrogen peroxide catalyzes luminol re reaction. You, so, you take uric acid react it with oxygen and you get H 2 O 2 as a byproduct and permit this uh, H 2 O 2 to react with uh, um, luminol and chemiluminescence is obtained. So, similarly uh, reaction um, re uh, similar reactions can be obtained by using glucose and then cholesterol and then choline, you can use amino acids, you can use aldehydes and the lactates all these have been detected in this way. You can take sucrose and um, um, water that uh, leads to hydrolyzation of sucrose leads to alpha D glucose and fructose and alpha D glucose can react with an enzyme called as mutarotase to produce beta D glucose and beta D glucose can react with oxygen in presence of glucose oxidase enzyme to produce gluconic acid and um, H 2 and H 2 O 2 can react with luminol to give chemiluminescence. And uh, so, you can correlate all these reactions and get back to the original concentrations of the reactant and the detection limits obtained in this way are from 0.1 ppm to 100 ppm, 100 uh, ppm. So, 
this is uh, what I wanted to teach you about uh, luminol uh, chemical luminescence reactions and uh, now I would uh, like to another take you to another aspect of fluorescence that is uh, x-ray fluorescence. I have decided to include this along with fluorescence actually I can x-ray fluorescence and x-ray absorption all almost all x-ray analytical techniques are grouped into separate category x-ray absorption, ESCA, OSHA and um, x-ray fluorescence etcetera. But I have decided to include uh, x-ray fluorescence in this uh, discussion because uh, it has got a similar phenomenon occurring whenever we are using x-rays and atoms that means fluorescence occurs. So, it is um, in the fitness of things that we should discuss x-ray fluorescence spectrometry um, also, but we uh, since we are uh, not discussing any other x-ray analytical techniques I thought it is prudent to include x-ray fluorescence techniques. So, now I would uh, like to uh, before I proceed further I would like to take you to uh, um, some of the important aspects of x-rays uh, you should understand. So, as you know we have while studying in the um, electromagnetic radiation we have stated that uh, x-rays are part of the electromagnetic radiation which vary from uh, which have got wavelengths in uh, 0.1 to 100 angstrom units. Now, you should also know a little more about the nature of x-rays before we talk about x-ray fluorescence. In this way I thought I will give you a small short introduction to the x-ray uh, x-rays. Uh, what we are uh, handling. In general x-rays are uh, short wavelength electromagnetic radiations. They are produced by the deceleration of high energy electrons or by electronic transitions of the electrons in the inner orbitals of the atoms. Now, what we mean by this is that x-rays you take the electrons allow them to um, bombard on a target using acceleration and uh, when the electron beam strikes a target uh, uh, some of them will hit the metal atoms instead of the empty space around the <coughs> around the nucleus. Sometimes the electrons will also hit the um, uh, electro inner orbitals uh, inner orbital electrons and knock them off from the orbits of the atoms. So, when an electron is removed from the atom from the k shell l shell you may you remember most of the things that we have discussed earlier that electrons are arranged in the in an atom uh, basically nucleus around it there are k, k electrons l electrons l l shell m shell etcetera. From the k shell suppose an electron is knocked off by uh, the incoming electron beam then an ion is excited atom is produced and uh, the uh, vacancy created in the k shell is filled by another from L shell or M shell or N shell etcetera to fill that vacancy. And um, during this process the um, deceleration of the electron beam generates x-rays. So, what we um, are talking about is basically what are x-rays? X-rays are short wavelength electromagnetic radiations they are produced by taking high beam high energy electrons produced from a cathode and directed onto the anode using electrode high electrode potential. And when they hit the atoms electrons are knocked off 
from the inner orbitals and the space created by the incoming radiation uh, is filled by an L shell or M shell or N shell etcetera and that wavelength corresponds to the X rays. So, we will uh, uh, if you study this uh, slide, uh, I have put together some of the thoughts that um, I have explained to you that uh, they are produced by the deceleration of high energy electrons or by electronic transitions of the electrons in the inner orbitals of the atoms. So, in general X rays have a wavelength of 10 raise to minus 5 angstroms to 100 angstrom units. Conventional X ray spectroscopy however, is largely confined to 0 0.1 angstroms to 25 angstroms. We do not deal with other uh, X ray uh, wavelengths, but co confined in general to 1 angstrom to 25 angstrom uh, units X rays. In this we have soft X rays and hard X rays etcetera. Soft X rays are the ones which are used in our day to day medical applications and um, uh, such as uh, bone, uh, uh, bone structure determination whenever you have an accident a bone is broken and all those things are images are done by X rays. And they are known as the X rays used in such cases are known as soft X rays. Hard X rays are still smaller wavelength which have got more energy, better penetrating power and they can be used for studying the changes in the atomic uh, uh, structures. And um, before we um, with this introduction, I want to tell you that X rays are generated by bombarding a metal target with a beam of high energy electrons. And uh, you can also generate X rays by exposing a substance to a primary beam of X ray. You take the X rays produced in one case and allow them to fall on a uh, secondary um, on uh, another metal atom. So, you can get another set of X rays. So, you either use electrons to generate X rays or X rays themselves produced by the electrons to generate secondary X rays. Then there is another source X rays can also be used uh, produced by using a radioactive source and uh, you as you all know a radioactive source generates X rays emits X rays during its decay process continuously. And so many such uh, isotopes are known and those X rays also can be used for analytical purposes. And then of course, there is another way of producing from a synchrotron radiation source, but this approach is not always very useful because synchrotrons are high energy high capital intensive systems where which are not easily available uh, for uh, day to day purposes. They are mostly research equipments and uh, research facilities created by the governments in particular places. And uh, in an X ray tube both uh, X rays are produced in X ray tubes. That means, you have to have the cathode, you have to have the anode both of them to be put in a bulb like structure and the, the electron beam has to be generated from the cathode and they have to be targeted onto the anode where they would be accelerated by the potential difference. So, the electrons are produced at the heated cathode usually made of tungsten. So, this uh, tungsten is a metal target cathode and they are accelerated towards another metal obviously that is known as the target and uh, that is uh, the electrons produced at the cathode must be accelerated and they should hit the target at very high speed. So, the uh, use of about 100 kV potential difference is almost mandatory in most of the X ray tubes and upon colliding with the anode part of the energy of the incident beam is converted into X rays. 
and the continuum X-ray spectrum, we get two types of spectrum, X-ray spectrum. One is continuous X-ray spectrum and another is a line spectrum. So, continuum spectrum you are all familiar because we have seen such uh, several such spectra in our uh, discussion in uh, molecular fluorescence, molecular absorbance and um, uh, chemiluminescence etcetera. Most of the things what we have discussed so far, they are all molecular fluorescences and now we are discussing about atomic fluorescence based on the pure metals. And um, of course, we will be discussing about uh, the we will be discussing about the uh, production of X-rays not only from pure metals, but also from some of the chemical substances compounds also. But whatever be the uh, way of production of X-rays, the spectrum the of the X-ray what you get out of it consists only of two types, one is a continuum spectrum, another is line spectrum. So, the continuum spectrum means there are no gaps and they exhibit a well defined short wavelength limit lambda 0, which is a characteristic of the applied voltage instead of the nature of the compound. So, um, what we are saying is the acceleration and the acceleration given to the electron beam by the voltage is more important in the production of X-rays and that leads to continuum X-ray, continuum spectrum. And this is a continuum spectrum from an X-ray tube with a tungsten target. So, what we have here? We have here wavelength and this is the relative intensity. I have plotted it as 0, 4, 8, 12 and then uh, wavelength is between 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.6, 0 0.8 and 1 uh, angstrom units that is 10 raise to minus 8 centimeters. And you can see the energy of the spectrum at uh, 0 0.2 is uh, around uh, this is produced around 50 kV and uh, it reaches a maximum and then it falls down. Same is the case if you use 0 0.3 40 kV, if you use 40 kV acceleration, it does not start from 0 0.2, but it starts from 0 0.3. And then if you use 35 kV potential difference, it may start somewhere from about point uh, approximately 0 0.28 or something. And then 30 kV, another spectrum starting from 0.4, 20 kV, it starts from 0 0.6. This type of spectrum is irrespective of the target. That means, it is only a function of the applied voltage that is 20, 30, 35, 40, 50 kV what we have employed in our discussion. So, this is uh, um, with a tungsten target generated from an X-ray tube. So, the continuous radiation results from collisions between the electrons and the atoms of the target each collision results in the emission of a photon. So, the energy of the photon is equal to the energy loss of the electron beam. You have an electron beam coming and hitting a target, the electron beam loses its energy and then uh, the short wavelength beam is produced and uh, this uh, the uh, therefore, the energy of the photon must always equal to the loss of energy of the electron present in the electron beam. So, a number of collisions with decreasing energy may occur because once the uh, uh, beam collides with one atom and uh, it decelerates and then part of its energy is reduced and uh, again uh, the reduced energy electron beam may hit another uh, molecule, another atom again its energy is reduced and then it may hit another atom. So, th the energy of the beam keeps on continuously reducing, falling down. The that is what we saw here that the energy uh, keeps on coming down. 
um, this, uh, this is what we have seen here. The as more and more collisions occur, the energy keeps on coming down. This is irrespective of the target. It is a function only of the voltage 20 kV to 50 kV what we have employed here in this picture. So, uh, the number of collisions with increasing energy may occur in each case as it bounces from one atom to another. Now, the maximum photon energy generated corresponds to the instantaneous deceleration of the electron to zero kinetic energy in a single collision. Suppose, a single collision happens and the energy is totally lost, then we have maximum photon energy because the photon energy must equal the loss of the energy kinetic energy of the electron beam. So, the maximum must correspond to the loss. So, the um, this leads to continuum energy. So, the kinetic energy of all the electrons can be expressed as Dion Hunt law. Uh, for example, V into E, it is a product of the applied potential and um, uh, the electronic charge corresponding to H mu 0 that is frequency into Planck's constant, which is nothing but H C by lambda that is we are replacing mu 0 by the wave velocity of the light and the wavelength. So, this is a very standard equation that is known where V is the applied potential and mu 0 is the frequency and we all know that frequency is expressed as C by lambda. So, uh, V E is equal to H C by lambda. Therefore, the kinetic energy is the product of uh, accelerating voltage and the charge on the electron and mu 0 is the number of maximum of the radiation that can be produced. Now, uh, X-ray line spectra. Now, so far we have discussed about X-ray continuum spectra. Now, we will discuss about X-ray line spectra. So, what is X-ray line spectra? They are all the results of electronic transitions in the innermost atomic orbitals like I, I was telling you that if they in hit an electron, they knock off the electron from the orbiting atom you know, from the nucleus, um, not from the nucleus, but from the inner orbitals k shell, l shell, m shell etcetera. From the k shell an electron is knocked off, the energy is so high that it is completely knocked off from the system and an excited ion is produced and to fill the vacancy another electron has to fall and the energy the um, corresponding to that wavelength is X-ray. So, X-ray line spectra result from electronic transitions in the innermost orbital atomic orbitals. They occur in the longer wavelength range of 4 to 6 angstrom units. In the previous uh, uh, in the previous uh, continuum spectra, we have seen that the inner wavelength is only up to one angstrom units here in the continuum spectra. But in the line spectra, we have the radiations occurring at longer wavelengths and uh, the longer wavelength than 0 0.1 uh, angstroms. So, the range is 4 to 6 angstrom units. The line spectra occur for all elements having atomic numbers of 12 and above and um, elements having atomic numbers less than 23 show only 2 lines and these 2 lines are called as k, k series and each line is designated as k alpha and k beta. These are of short wavelengths. For example, k series for tungsten target appear at 0 0.18 and 0 0.218. Now, you can see here the line spectra with a molybdenum target I have presented. It is basically um, relative plot of wavelength versus relative intensity 
and um, the wavelength varies from 0 to 1 um, uh, angstrom units and um, around 35 kV line if we use we get a spectrum like this. This is similar to what I have shown you earlier as a continuum spectrum, but in addition when you use a molybdenum target you get another two lines one is uh, around 15 intensity another is 37 and this occurs k line this is k alpha and uh, this is k beta and this uh, the energy corresponding to this is about 0 0.7 and this uh, 0.62 or something and this is around uh, 0 0.7. So, you would uh, appreciate that only two lines spectra are obtained with respect to molybdenum. So, elements having atomic numbers more than 23 show another series known as L series and they are also designated as alpha 1 and beta 1. There is a threshold voltage for which for each element below which line spectra do not appear. So, to get line spectra you must use a minimum accelerating force of about 50, 30, 5 etcetera depending upon each element. For example, below 50 kilo volts no line spectra is obtained for molybdenum and if you use acceleration voltage below 50 no line spectra you will get only the continuum spectra. However, above 70 kilo volts it produces line spectra. So, this is uh, the discussion what we are having about understanding of the properties of x-rays and then we will continue our discussion in the next class about the properties and then we can see how we can use this instrument the these properties for the x-ray fluorescence because uh, x-ray fluorescence analytical technique is a wonderful technique for the determination of most of the inorganic elements that um, uh, you can even study the surface properties. So, that is why it is so important for us to understand what is x-ray fluorescence and before that we had to know more about x-rays. So, we will continue our discussion in the next class.